We've come to our last panel of the day, and I think you'll agree when it's over that it has been worth the wait. ALPA's general manager, Lori Garver, who before joining ALPA was NASA's deputy administrator. Lori will moderate this panel on the integration of commercial space with commercial airline operations. It's a fascinating topic, very timely, and we can't wait to hear what her panelists have to say. Lori, you can go ahead and start. We're doing sort of a, uh, a keep one turn in quick turn here on the, uh, the panel, so we're going to get some other people mic'd, but please go ahead and start. Uh, this is a topic that is near and dear to my heart, having spent a 30-year career in the space industry. It is gratifying, yet somewhat ironic, to be talking about sharing the airspace with a growing commercial space field, because much of my career was spent really trying to make sure there was a growing commercial space uh, industry. Uh, we have so many things in common, but one of those things that has come up more recently, uh, as Mark mentioned, are the shared airspace issues. We use the airspace on the aviation side for the majority of our flights. The space uh, launch and return business uses it for a few seconds, but we do share it nonetheless. And there have been a number of recent uh, studies. The ARCs, I think there's three at the FAA, have begun to look into this issue. We at ALPA are participating and trying to help lead the discussion helping us understand each other. There's a lot of misinformation out there, and this panel is somewhat about trying to dispel some of that information. Having the aviation community, the pilots, uh, recognize what is happening in commercial space. I know a lot of us here, there's gonna be several flights a week, and people, tourists, going to space, and while I would uh, love for that to be the case someday, I and these folks can assure you it's going to be quite some time before that happens, and we are going to have some time here to integrate our airspace in a way that uh, reduces the amount of time that the uh, airlines have to stand down and allows uh, for safe transport to and from space. So I thought I would just get us started with a couple of uh, similarities to make sure that as we work together to develop the tools to uh, reduce uh, the conflicts that we will uh, eventually uh, come across in the airspace that uh, we have a lot of similarities as well. So I'm known for top 10 lists. I have a quick top 10 ways that uh, the commercial aviation and space uh, communities are similar. Number 10. Both utilize speed to defy gravity. Okay. Number nine, both had to break with a status quo at the beginning to succeed. Number eight, both have a shared mission and purpose to mobilize earthlings and things to benefit humanity. We're going to talk about their purpose. It's very similar. Number seven, both communities are underrepresented by women. That's one we're going to work on. Number six, success and advancement of both depend on safe, efficient access to the airspace. We have this in common. This is one big thing we're going to talk about. Number five, airline pilots and astronauts are both rock stars. And number four, airline pilots and astronauts both know they're rock stars. <laughs> astronauts are worse, I assure you. Number three, both communities take the creation and use of acronyms to new heights. <laughs> number two, US are undisputed leaders in both, and uh, both industries contribute hundreds of billions of dollars to the economy, commercial aviation, a lot more, but still getting there, that's great. And the number one way commercial aviation and space are similar, both were founded and carried out by unrelenting pioneers, many of whom risked their lives to open their respective frontiers. We are very 
lucky to have many of those pioneers here on the stage today. I'm going to go uh, in order here and introduce our panelists, uh, many of whom are going to describe where they work, so I won't go into too much about that. Our first speaker is Kelvin Coleman. He is the Acting Associate Administrator for the Commercial Space Transportation Office at FAA. So FAA has an office, they call it AST, and it is responsible for the safety and advancement of U.S. commercial space transportation. Uh, Kelvin's going to tell us about this office, how many licenses they've already been giving out over the years. This is not something new. And he's been with uh, this office for 20 years, for instance. So it is not new. I recall very, very well uh, the different forms it's taken. Uh, but it is an office that every non-governmental launch has to uh, work with to get a license. And Kelvin's going to tell us about it. Great. Well, thank you, Lori. I appreciate that. And thank you to Alpha for having me. Uh, here uh, for this uh, safety forum, as, as, as Lori mentioned, uh, commercial space is a tremendously exciting uh, arena. Uh, I've uh, been around it for about 20 years now, and uh, the last several years, the last decade or so, has been really, really exciting. And we're seeing uh, new and novel technologies being brought to the market, and we're really uh, excited about that. Uh, what I want to do very briefly is talk about our office, uh, uh, AST. Uh, we're one of the five lines of business at the FAA. So I want to share with you a little bit about what we do and, and how we operate. And I have a short video uh, to start with. And let's see if we can get that going. Seven, six, five, four, three, two. The FAA plays a vital role in commercial space launch and re-entry operations in the United States. The FAA's Office of Commercial Space Transportation, or AST, regulates the U.S. commercial space transportation industry to protect public health and safety, property, and national security and foreign policy interests of the United States. A unique focus of AST is to encourage, facilitate, and promote the industry through education and consultation with commercial space companies, the academic community, and state and local leaders. Through AST, the FAA issues licenses or experimental permits for commercial space transportation activities, and it licenses new spaceport operations by facilitating initial designs and establishing agreements between the FAA and operators to conduct space launch and re-entry activities from specific sites. AST monitors and inspects operations to ensure launches, re-entries, and any research and development activities won't harm public health or damage public or government property. And AST ensures all FAA regulations are followed during launches and re-entries. AST also manages mishap response coordination and enforcement programs and oversees safety inspection training and certification. During launch and re-entry, AST coordinates with the FAA's Air Traffic Organization to integrate space operations into the national airspace system. This joint effort ensures that conventional air traffic can safely operate during launch and re-entry of commercial space vehicles. In critical regulatory and policy roles, AST personnel work with other government agencies to develop policies and guidelines, assign responsibilities, and provide direction and accountability for space activities. AST also collaborates on best practices for space transportation operations. So next time you hear about a rocket lifting off or a space vehicle landing somewhere in the U.S., you'll realize the FAA has an important role in making commercial space transportation happen. And as we look to the future, AST will continue to help ensure the safety of new commercial space endeavors, such as public suborbital flights and the establishment of commercial space stations. A little short video on, on our office. Um, we've been around since 1984. We began uh, by way of an executive order from uh, uh, President Reagan that uh, established the Department of Transportation as the lead federal agency for a commercial launch in the U.S. Uh, shortly thereafter, the Congress passed legislation 
uh, with, through the Commercial Space Launch Act, which really established uh, the Office of Commercial Space Transportation and the Office of the Secretary, which is where we remained for a number of years until 1995. Uh, when the Clinton administration moved the Office of Commercial Space Transportation to the FAA, where we've been ever since. So we're now one of the five lines of businesses that I mentioned. And we have a twofold mission. Uh, first and foremost is public safety. Uh, that's job one for us. Uh, we work with our, our partners in the Department of Defense, uh, the, uh, the FCC, Department of Commerce, NASA, and others uh, to ensure that as launch activities are occurring in the U.S., uh, we don't uh, infringe upon any national security or foreign policy interests. Uh, through those licensing activities. And also, as mentioned in the video, we have a pretty unique uh, mission within the FAA, and that is to encourage, facilitate, and promote the industry. And, and the way we do that is we really work uh, very collaboratively with uh, the industry that we regulate uh, to ensure both safe and successful uh, missions. Uh, mission success is really not a part of our, our, our construct, but we do want to see launches take place on time, especially launches that have uh, national implications. And I should also mention, over, the, over our existence, we have a pretty good safety record as well. We've had over 350 launches uh, to date with no public casualties or in injuries uh, to the public or significant property damage su suffered by the public. Uh, this is just the uh, outline of our products and services. Primarily, we, we, conduct, we issue licenses and permits. We uh, do safety approvals for, license for vehicle components and systems and personnel. Uh, we also, as the video mentioned, we conduct safety inspections and oversight to ensure compliance uh, with the licenses that we issue. Uh, we conduct environmental reviews, uh, as well as uh, rulemaking activities. Uh, I don't know if you've been keeping pace, but there's a pretty significant rulemaking underway right now. Uh, the Trump administration uh, just passed uh, Space Policy Directive 2, uh, which is really about reforming uh, licensing and reentry uh, regulations, as well as other regulations in the commercial space arena. And uh, we have a pretty aggressive goal in front of us now uh, to streamline and consolidate uh, outdated regulations to really enable uh, this industry. So we're working hard at that, and uh, we expect good things to come out of that. Uh, these are the types of activities that we regulate. Uh, expendable launch vehicles, I think most people, when they think of space transportation, they think of the big expendable rockets like the Falcon 9 and the Atlas V, those types of rockets. We also have reusable launch vehicles uh, like uh, New Shepard that's pictured there. And then we have the hybrid launch vehicles. Uh, and, and Todd will talk a little bit about uh, what they're doing uh, with Virgin Galactic. Uh, but we have their Virgin Orbit. Uh, that's a former uh, 747 that was a part of the Virgin Atlantic fleet that they've converted to a really a first stage uh, that will carry a, lock, uh, a rocket to altitude and release it, where the rocket will then take a payload into space. And then you have the uh, White Knight 2, which Todd pilots, uh, that takes the uh, spaceship 2 to altitude and takes uh, people into space, and, and we're looking forward to that uh, in the very near future. And then also there's reentry vehicles, and, and perhaps Karen will talk a little bit about the, the Dragon uh, vehicle that delivers cargo to the International Space Station. But all of these technologies are very diverse, uh, very complex, and we oversee all of these activities. Uh, spaceports, um, a lot of interest around spaceports these days. There are 10 licensed spaceports in the US. Um, uh, I will say the predominant number of activities still take place from the east, eastern range in, in Florida and the western range in Vandenberg. Uh, Todd does a lot of operations out of uh, Mojave Air and Spaceport in California. Uh, but we have a number of spaceports licensed uh, right now. And uh, you see some, some in the middle of the country there in Oklahoma and then also in Texas. Not a lot of activity there. Uh, but, um, you know, hopefully that will change in the future. We'll see how that goes. Just a brief overview of our licensing process, really three phases. This, this is very different than vehicle certification or pilot certification, if you will, that can take a number of years, if you will. Uh, we start with pre-application consultation where an applicant comes in and we explain to them what our rules are all about. We better understand what they're proposing. Once we uh, receive an application from that applicant, then we have a, a, about 180 days to make a determination to either license that activity or deny it. And what, what has to be demonstrated is the is, is, is adherence to our public safety requirements. So if an if applicant can demonstrate uh, 
uh, adherence to those requirements, then we issue a license. If not, then we deny that license. Uh, we also issue experimental permits, and that's a little shorter time period that we have to issue those. That's 120 days. Once that uh, license or permit is issued, then, uh, as was mentioned earlier, we uh, engage in, in, in oversight activities, inspection activities, to make sure that the licensees comply with those uh, terms and conditions of the license or permit. And so, uh, commercial aviation, commercial space transportation, uh, uh, Lori mentioned some of the similarities. Um, there's obviously a few differences. Uh, commercial aviation is a little bit more mature, been around a little bit longer than commercial space transportation. Uh, we're talking about aircraft versus launch and reentry vehicles. Uh, obviously, there's a lot more operations in the national airspace system on the aviation side than commercial space. I'll talk a little bit about uh, what, where we've been in terms of the number of last launches uh, over the past decade and what we expect to see going forward. Uh, those numbers are increasing, and I'll talk about that momentarily. Um, I mentioned earlier, uh, our framework is, is really uh, revolved around licensing. We don't do certification of vehicles. We license operations uh, versus certifying a, a vehicle, if you will. And we have, in our industry, space flight participants. We don't call them passengers. It's a little different. If you're, if you're a passenger boarding an American Airlines or a Southwest flight, you expect to board a vehicle that's met the highest level of standards, and the FAA, in essence, has stamped that vehicle and, and declared it to be safe. A little different on the space side, where a space flight participant uh, signs uh, uh, an informed consent form, to, which, whereby they are consenting that they understand the risk associated with the flight, uh, sort of like going to your doctor, where you say, hey, I understand uh, what the risk is here, and I'm, I'm, I'm saying, hey, sign me up, I'm ready to go. And that's, that's how we work on the commercial space side. So where have we been the last 10 years? As you can see, there's been a steady climb in, in launches. Last year, we had a record of 23 uh, licensed launches in the calendar year. And this year, we're already uh, up to 21 through two thirds of the year. And we expect a handful more uh, the remainder of this year. So we're going to break that, break that record. And looking forward a little bit, uh, you can see our forecast there. We expect the, the number of launches to, to increase steadily over the next few years. Um, We've talked a lot about the possibility of seeing a launch daily. You know, um, I think we're a few years away from that, but um, I think we'll get there eventually, but, but, but probably not next year, if you will. So, that's, so I, I look forward to your questions and uh, look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I appreciate it. So <clears throat> I did have a top 10 list initially of the differences, and it just because we had in the prep call made sure you guys knew this wasn't a debate, I went with the similarities, but there are a lot of differences as well. Um, and at the, for our next speaker, you know, all these bios are in your program and in the app, but uh, our next speaker is Todd Erickson, and he is the Vice President for Safety and Test at Virgin Galactic. Uh, that is a space flight company that he's gonna talk to you a lot about. And I will just note that last Thursday afternoon we were going to have our panels pre-call, and Todd let us know a couple hours before that he was gonna have to miss it, and that was fine. We set it up for Friday afternoon just for him, and turned out, you know, he said he had all a couple things he had going on that day. Well, uh, that afternoon, Todd was the pilot in command of White Knight 2, which is the carrier aircraft for Spaceship 2, which uh, reached a new altitude record in the mesosphere that afternoon. So we had to miss the panel pre-call. Sorry, sorry, you guys. And he didn't even tell us all that. It was, it was so awesome. And um, I will also note that is not in his bio. His father is a United pilot and ALPA member for four decades. So welcome, Todd. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Lori um, and men and women of ALPA, I just want to thank you for the honor of being here today, uh, as well as the discussions we had in a very productive session yesterday. Uh, I'd like to say, you know, we're at an inflection point in history. Space, which used to be the uh, domain of states for the last half century, is now opening for routine low-cost access for all of mankind. Uh, currently, 564 people, and unfortunately only 61 women, I think, have uh, viewed the Earth from space. Uh, Virgin Galactic's current roster uh, will double and greatly diversify those numbers over the next several years. Uh, the nexus of low-cost launch and smaller satellites will make it economically attractive for companies to invest the billions of dollars of private equity required. 
Uh, it's the space analog of what the 1920s and 30s were for commercial aviation. All marketplace re revolutions come with some promise of the future, but also uncertainty for the status quo due to misunderstandings, incorrect assumptions, and fear of change. Uh, the safe and effective integration of both conventional aircraft and spacecraft into the NAS is critical to the future of both of our industries. It's a goal we've uh, effectively accomplished over the last 50 years. Discussions such as this and several ongoing FAA rulemaking committees in which we are both uh, involved are critical to the understanding of the constraints and the opportunities. Uh, the Virgin Space Companies are unique uh, in this regard, as our air launch vehicles use a conventional aircraft as the reusable first stage and operate under FAA regulations for both aircraft and spacecraft certification and licensing. Uh, the video I'm about to show you is a brief overview of our flagship suborbital space flight system, as well as our new 747 based small satellite launch platform. The exploration of space will go ahead. And it is one of the great adventures of all time. Humans have managed to learn so much about the universe in such a relatively small time frame compared with the life of the universe, and that was always very incredible to me. Armed. You know, I think that I and most of the people in this team choose to be in space because you're part of something that is changing the way humans look at the world, the way we relate to each other, the way we live. We have an opportunity here to do aerospace better and we're doing it on a landmark program that's going to change the world. By bringing hundreds and eventually thousands of people into space, they'll get a different perspective on life and on our future. And that over time, that will have a profound impact on how humanity faces its toughest problems. Together, we can make space accessible in a way that has only been dreamt of before now. And by doing that, we can truly bring positive change to life on Earth. I'd love to go into space. I think there could, be, there could be nothing nicer. So if you're building a spacecraft, I'd love to come with you on it. Well, unfortunately, nobody was building Richard a spacecraft, so he decided he had to do it himself. Uh, in the early 2000s, Burt Rutan was building the Virgin Atlantic Global Flyer pictured here, which ultimately set a distance record of 25,766 miles unrefueled. Uh, at the same time, he was building Spaceship One, winner of the Ansari X Prize, and then Richard's Muse for the vision of commercial spaceflight. What you see here is the current state of that vision. The Spaceship Two project on the left and Launcher One is on the right. It's amazing to be part of Virgin Space. Our recent and future successes, like those of the airline industry, are built on lessons learned from harder times. Ours was October 31st, 2014. On that day, Scaled Composites lost our first vehicle and their co-pilot in a tragic accident, which most of you are familiar. The NTSB's most significant conclusion was that the accident was due to Scaled's composites design of the feather lock system, which allowed a single pilot action uh, to result in a catastrophic failure. Shortly thereafter, Virgin took over the entire program, finishing the build of our current vehicle, Spaceship 2 Unity, and her flight testing. Our first step was a bottoms-up, top-down review of the design to understand and identify and correct any deficiencies. The most important task, however, I'd submit was not technical. It was creating a proactive learning culture of safety. Uh, at Virgin, we call it our North Star. We recognize that accomplishing anything worthwhile requires risk, and that managing risk requires a reliable and true compass for our guidance on the journey, our North Star. 
So safety is our North Star in all of our decisions. Our mission is to bring people to space and back. Yours is to move them from one point to another across the globe. Doing so safely requires both of us to constantly evaluate our operation from all aspects. It's a dynamic and ever-changing task. The airline if, if the airline industry did not improve their safety from the 1950s accident rates, uh, we'd be losing the equivalent of a 747 full of passengers every couple days. The nascent commercial space industry is at the beginning of our journey, but we have the great fortune of aerospace's best practices and successes as a foundation. The essential tenet of true risk management is to first ensure that the hazards association, associated with an operation are understood, controlled, and mitigated so that they don't become a reality. This ultimately comes down to the people and the culture. At Virgin, we've created a culture that does that by handpicking uh, operators to put them in key safety positions with independent reporting to the CEO and board of directors. It's by design that I am both an active test pilot and vice president of safety and test. As operators, we are those with the most to lose if something goes wrong, but we also offer a unique and critical perspective as to what the true hazards are. Uh, we do this by striving to separate the real risks from the imagined ones. We are all human after all, and we filter our risk based on our own personal backgrounds, biases, and understanding. It's equally easy to see a hazard when there's not one as it is to miss the obvious one right under your nose. The cure is to look at the problem pragmatically and from multiple perspectives by harnessing the wisdom and experts in various disciplines. Ultimately, the hard, uh, ultimately let the hard data and humility, not emotions, be your North Star. Uh, we do that by learning from our successes. I mean, anyone can correct a failure. What is difficult is to determine if your success was because you were lucky or because you were good. Uh, each of our test flights ends in a month-long process analyzing all of the data obtained to answer that simple question. As almost every incident is preceded by signs that signal what is about to happen, it is imperative that we are able to read the signs and fix the problems before they manifest themselves. So in doing this, our North Star culture allows us to take prudent risks associated with spaceflight while ensuring the safety of our astronauts and the uninvolved public uh, as we open space to change the world for good. This video is from last week's flight and it'll give you a taste of what this experience is like. Last Thursday, Kelly Latimer and I carried Spaceship Two to an altitude of 47,000 feet and released her at 0.5 Mach. Following our 2G pull-up due to the immediate loss of half of our mass and then an ensuing climb to 53,000 feet at idle, idle power, Dave McKay and Mike Masucci rode Spaceship's three Gs of acceleration to just over 170,000 feet in our third powered flight this release, week. Release, release, release. Fire, fire. Although Newsweek emphatically reported us achieving twice the speed of light on this mission, <laughs> Fake news. I, I, I must admit that our top speed was just under Mach 2.5. <laughs> our propulsion team is amazing, but they're not quite that good yet. Energy height 172. 171. Good, unlock, unlocking. Okay, doublets are complete. Switches are coming clean. All right, further handles coming out. Beautiful black sky. Still a good pitch rate. Amazing view. Well, that is a million dollar view out the window, Dave. Maybe the all first, Dave. Yeah. So additionally, uh, this last week saw the initial mating of our rocket pylon to our serendipitously named former Virgin Atlantic 747-400 airliner Cosmic Girl. In the next week's time, we will complete the initial envelope expansion flight testing of the pylon, leading to our first orbital launch by the end of the year, where we will fly a 2G pull-up 
to a release attitude of 33 degrees nose up. Release occurs at approximately 37,000 feet and about 230 knots. Uh, I'll say the zero G recovery after apogeeing at about 3390 is certainly a lot of fun, but I don't recommend doing it on your next revenue trip. <laughs> And I'll end with a still shot of the perspective Sir Richard uh, wants everybody on this planet to experience. Spaceship Earth, she's mighty but frail. Uh, borders and politics don't matter from this vantage. We're all in it together. And his hope is that we will use space to change the world for good. Thank you. Oh, well, we did uh, probably all prefer, we would have preferred to be there than at our panel prep call, even though it was awesome. Thank you for sharing that. So you all know him for the panel, our elected first vice president, uh, Captain Joe DePeat, uh, a FedEx captain and the head of the air safety organization for all of ALPA. I know there's a lot of people who probably believe we are taking a leadership position on this issue because of my background. And I can assure you, and you will know after he says a few things, that it is really largely because of his passion that we are doing this. He has been driving us to be leaders of this for uh, the last more than a year uh, with the support of Captain Knoll and we uh, are happy to have you join the panel and talk about what ALPA is doing to help lead this and, and kick off the hopefully Q&A. Great, Lori, thank you and uh, welcome our, to our guests and thank you for coming. Uh, I know we had the conversation on the telephone and you came to one of our meetings so it was really fantastic. I'm really excited about this area of the industry right now, the commercial space. Um, let me let me kind of give you a quick background on, on how it attracted and got on our radar. Uh, when the, uh, a spaceport in, in the Denver area, right, the Adams County, the Front Range air, air, spaceport started, uh, obviously uh, that being a pretty congested area in terms of, uh, you know, commercial aviation, actually, you know, so it got on our radar. Um, it was fortuitous that uh, we happened to have the foresight of having a general manager that had some experience uh, in these areas. And so I immediately uh, consulted with engineering or safety and with Lori, and we sat down and we had this discussion, which followed up with my visit to the CompStack, the, the Commercial uh, Space Transportation Advisory Committee. And really interesting, I learned an, an, a real lot that day. Um, but the thing that really jumped out at me the most was the need for communication between, you would think, you know, commercial space is essentially a most out, out growth out of commercial aviation, the whole pioneer, what I love about it, the whole pioneer spirit that it reflects, you know, that started this whole thing. But um, it was pretty clear to me that there was a, a, a lack of connection there. There wasn't really a lot of discussion. So I seized the microphone, decided to ask if I could, you know, stood up and wanted to ask a question. And I talked about some of what I saw as maybe some of the commonalities that might be possible for some of the lessons learned by us in the uh, commercial aviation business and some of the things that we do. Um, and it opened up a really interesting dialogue. And then the discussion was, you know, um, should we have a, later on we discussed about having a meeting. So I wanted to hold a meeting first with the commercial aviation folks and basically kind of explore interest there. Um, it was pretty clear to me that it seemed like most of the commercial space folks were willing to have this dialogue. So the, that was a very successful meeting. The next meeting, um, although you did come to that, that which I thought was fantastic. But the, um, the other one was the, um, we want to have commercial aviation and commercial space together in one room. And we want to listen to one another because I feel like in this dialogue, you know, words really do matter. And some of the, some of the concerns really center around seg uh, segregated airspace, right? Um, You've heard it mentioned before, commercial aviation's been around for a long time, right? Um, most of our risk factors are 10 to the minus 9. Space may be a little bit less, right? 10 to the minus 6 or whatever, which predicates that we need, means that basically we need some segregated airspace when a launch takes place. But my immediate questions were, were we taking advantage of all the things and all the tools that we have together now? And that's when I talked to you, Kevin, about some of that. Are we using the tools that we have available now to basically manage that airspace a lot better? I know ALPA is equipped to have that dialogue. I mean, we, you know, we are the largest non-governmental safety, security, pilot systems, jump seat organization, we have a tremendous amount of talent in this area, and we thought we could probably help to facilitate a dialogue, and that's why I'm really excited about this. Hopefully when we have that other meeting and everybody's together, we can uh, 
We can listen to one another, learn about each other's concerns, um, chart a path forward. And I had a um, great uh, uh, safety chairman, former one, Chuck Hogeman, who was sitting right over there, who had a saying one time. He said, build the sidewalk where the footpath is. And I think as, as commercial space begins to go down that path, I think it will reveal more and more about where we can find places to collaborate. And I'm really excited about that. So um, hopefully after that takes place, and if that's a, a, a you know, really good outcome, which I predict it will be, um, we'd like to have maybe a one-day conference. You know, we do this air safety forum uh, all week long, but we also do many uh, each time, sometimes four or five times a year, we'll do a one-day conference and hopefully get all the decision makers in here and maybe have a good dialogue. So I'm just, I'm extremely excited about this. I think that we have a good background that could help with a lot of this, and that's, that's why we're all here today. So I want to leave some time for any questions. Yes, thank you. Because I know you. we're getting kind of close here, so. Thank you very much. You. Yes, please come to the microphones if you have questions. I, of course, will ask them if you don't, but here. And you can let me know if we have others. Hi, Go ahead. John Drexler. I'm the Director of Air Traffic Control with Air Traffic Services Group. I want to start off by saying, Todd, thank you very much for your presentation yesterday at our tech group. We appreciate it. Uh, I do have a question. Joe has kind of aimed at you a little bit. Um, my question is this. How do we at ALPA reconcile our mantra, a one level of safety, with the use of joint airspace, where the acceptable level of risk in the national airspace system is 10 to the minus 9, <coughs> excuse me, and the, uh, uh, in the uh, transitional uh, areas where you're going to be flying through, it's lowered to 10 to the minus 7. So in, in the uh, transitional hazard area. So how would you uh, address that? I'm glad you asked that question because I got asked that question at CompStack, okay, how, how we're going to close that gap. And, you know, I liken this to our experience even in commercial aviation when the commercial air safety team was formed. And we started to do from, we changed from a forensic approach towards accident investigation to a more proactive to a very aggressive data collection effort. So it wasn't like it just happened overnight, all right? Um, a, a wise uh, a former uh, associate administrator for safety, Peggy Gilligan, decided one day, the way she put it off, when we had a private conversation, she got all the decision makers in the room, all the interested parties, all the stakeholders, and she basically locked the door and said, you know, we need to work on these issues together. I want to go on record by saying that it's untenable to think that we can have and continue to have segregated airspace. We are for a shared NAS, right? Uh, now, uh, space is a little different, right? Obviously, when they leave the upper limits of the NAS. But it is, I think it's a thing that we get together on and we begin to listen. That's why I think listening to one another is really important and using the tools that we already have. Right now, um, the way they manage the airspace, and Kelvin, you can jump right in if you'd like, it's, it's, it's a bit of a blunt tool at, at, you know, right now. There's a fairly large swath of airspace. And so my experience, just in the ATS side, John, you know, is that some of the already existing uh, next-gen uh, capabilities that are you know, coming online, as well as the time-based flow management, might be used to mitigate some of that uh, to, you know, basic, maybe even a, a moving piece of airspace instead of just one continuous swath. Uh, along with this SDI, the Space Data Integrator, I know that that's on the, on, on the table. And so I, I think it's now, it's not that they're, you know, com the way I look at commercial space, they're not a new entrant. They're not like UAS, right? I mean, they are, they've been around for a really long time. It's just that through the advances of the technology now, their capability is increasing. Right now, they're not, uh, the number of operations compared to ours is so, you know, great difference, right? I mean, how many, how many launches do, you, do we plan to have next year, roughly? Do you, uh, would you say about 40, 30, 30? 30, 30. 30. Yeah. So, but as that begins to increase, there's no question that we're going to have to have this dialogue. And as Opa, ALPA always does, we want to jump in early and we want to be part of that discussion. Because I think, I think that we have a lot to share in terms of our experiences and they have a lot to share with us. Because I'm going to tell you something. When we start doing, you know, uh, New York to Tokyo, right? That's not going to be done at 370. Okay, that's going to be suborbital, and I know I'll, I wouldn't be surprised if FedEx is already, you know, hot on this. But so we really need to be involved in this conversation. I wish I could tell you that, you know, I have all the answers to how to close that gap, 
But I think there's a pathway to closing that gap. It's not just going to happen you know, tomorrow. But there's things that we could do right now and tools that we could use right now to begin to go down that pathway. Uh, just as a follow-up question, Joe, I'm just wondering if you've noticed any participation by A4A or the airlines as far as, far as the economic impact right. of these launches. Because I remember you, you uh, there was a slide you had showed us, Todd, that showed from one launch what the uh, how many miles aircraft had sure. to fly around it, what the delays increase were. So you, that's one launch. So what happens when we start looking at hundreds of launches, or maybe someday thousands of launches. Right. Do you mind if I say something? Yep. Quickly here? Um, is it, so, you know, that's true. And, and one of the things I think in terms of going back to, you know, let's make sure that we're all looking at the real hazards and the real problem and really understanding the, uh, the issue. Uh, we tend to throw out numbers like 10 to the minus 9, 10 to the minus 6, minus 7th, right? And you really need to understand what those numbers mean because they are not the same, right? So, um, so, so I, I think that people go away with a inappropriate assurance of 10 to the minus 9th safety for the national aerospace system, and they say, well, 10 to the minus 7th isn't the same. There, there's a lot of details in there where really it is. And, and so, um, so, so we can talk a little bit more. It's, it's a much more involved discussion as to where those numbers come from. But, uh, but, but the essential thing is, you know, these arcs that we're working on are to ensure an equivalent level of safety for the uninvolved uh, public to the launches. And, and that's going to continue on. There are some things that we can do, I think, to uh, sharpen the pencil and, you know, work with the FAA to lower and, and reduce the impact areas of that. But I don't think anybody's talking about reducing the uh, level of safety to the, uh, to the flying public. No, and actually, point if I could... well taken in that a lot of your operations occur out over the ocean. However, I see slides with spaceports that would be in Denver Front Range or Midland, Texas, or places sure. like that where they're not going to be taking place out over the ocean. Right. I think it's an, impor an important point um, to think about that is that, you know, the activities that, are gonna, that could potentially occur there are going to limit it, be limited by the acceptable level of risk as well, right? So our activities only occur from um, coastal areas specifically in order to achieve the level of safety that we need to achieve. And so we're not going to be launching from the center of the country anytime soon. Um, I, have no, I have no thought that we have any plans to do it at all, but to the extent that we conduct orbital launch activities right now, they will occur from, from coastal regions so as to launch out over the water. An, an important point about this, though, is that if you add up all of the time that SpaceX's vehicles have, have spent in the NAS um, in 2017, so our launches and our reentries that occurred, you're in under an hour of transit time, right? In, in the case of a launch, it's about 90 seconds until we're above 60,000. And, and when we fly back, that's under a minute of flyback time. So it's a really quick time period. And I think that's an important part of the conversation about what we're, what we're up against. And it's also a really short small number, right? 20-something compared to 42,000 a day, 15.5 million in a year. So I think that as we see, as we have an opportunity right now that we're eager to capitalize on to work together, and we very much appreciate the engagement that we've had with ALPA and the um, work that we're going to be able to do with other um, aviation entities, hopefully, um, and, and to, to work towards supporting tool development tool, and tool integration that will better integrate our activities so that a controller can actually see a space launch on their scope, right, and actually see that happening in real time, see that it's cleared the airspace and you can immediately take action as a result, or if you need to take action, if something goes wrong and you need to take action to, to respond to that, that you have appropriately modeled tools that are taking into account the weather on that given day, that given launch, and you can respond appropriately. So we think that we have a lot of low-hanging fruit in that regard that we can start working together on achieving um, that will make everyone's lives in your industry and in ours a lot better. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yep. I was going to add, too, if I could, um, one of the things that I found very encouraging at CompStack, because there was a, you know, think about the early days of the commercial aviation industry. Think about the personalities involved in this, and you know, the CEOs of these companies, your respective companies, very similar in terms of characteristics of the early pioneers in this, in our uh, end of the business. Well, maybe and they one need of the to things that organize them. What's that? Maybe they need to be organized them. Well, <laughs> well quite possibly, quite possibly. Um, but I did, I did notice when they when they mentioned the com how competitive they are. Right, the company is very competitive. 
um, I made the comment that, you know, in the, in the commercial aviation industry, we learned very quickly you don't compete on safety, right? You work together, you collaborate on safety. And I saw a lot of writing going on. And, we, and I think that's an, that's, an open, that's an open door. And you mentioned arcs. Sometimes arcs are not the best places, you know, to really build collaboration. It kind of needs to be done earlier, and that's what we're trying to do, is we want to have those conversations in the safe room, in the, in the trust tree, right? So that when we get to the arcs, we're all on the same page. Right? We'll get to the next question. I just want to note your question on A4A's participation. They were at the meeting Joe talked about with the aviation. Uh, community and are very involved in, in our work. Sir. Hi, Dan Hanlon. Um, Todd, uh, this is a question for you and for the others, Joe, also. Um, first, I could tell the pride in your voice of the business that you're in and what you guys are doing. You're doing some wonderful work. It's just an amazing company. Uh, you brought up your North Star Safety Initiative. Um, Spending 30 years studying pilot procedures and writing them, et cetera, I, I thought that the probable cause for uh, Spaceship Two was a sea change for the NTSB. It wasn't pilot error. Typically, it's all pilot error. And this one was not. It was the operating procedures, the operating system. On the 31st of May, Joe and, and the leadership at ALPA put together a seminar to talk about human factors and pilot soaps and human-centered operating principles. And it seems to me that uh, your North Star initiative must be focused on the operating system, the operating procedures, because of the probable cause it was not pilot error. It was, it was that. Could you speak to that? Could you speak to the North Star initiative with regard to your review of that accident and what we can learn from it? And I think of the idea of a seminar to combine what they've learned in this possible sea change at the NTSB where they're focused on operating systems more so than the 80% pilot error issue. Um, this was a simple mistake, but it was basically not written by the NTSB as that. So could you talk to that, please? Thank you. Yeah, so, um, so, so I'll say, you know, in my 2,000 hours flying the F-16, um, I, I can, swear that I came back down from a sortie and went to disarm my ejection seat and realized they never armed it in the first place, right? I missed a critical step in a safety checklist. And, you know, so that puts my reliability at maybe about one in 500, which I think is pretty much uh, what the NASA standard reliability for human factors are for errors of omission and commission. And so I'm, I'm no different than anyone else, right? Uh, so human factors are real. It's something that we, you know, is critical. Uh, designing out human factors to ensure that, you know, a single step does not cause a catastrophic accident uh, is essential in uh, airliners. It is essential in uh, spacecraft as well. Uh, so one of the things that we have done at Galactic is, you know, we've gone through to look for, hey, is there anything that we could do as air crew or even having our, um, our astronauts in the back floating around, you know, can they do anything that could inadvertently cause an, an issue? And we've gone through and put uh, safeguards in there. So essentially anything that's critical has got at least two steps. Um, we have a extensive crew resource management program. Uh, you know, we've got a small cadre of seven of us uh, flying the vehicle or will fly the vehicle. And so we are intimately involved learning from each flight, hey, we thought this was the way we were going to do it for this next flight. We did it. Uh, we can do some improvements. I need to do this better or that better. So it's a very living and collaborative effort to ensure that, A, we design out human factors issues, and then we also put other safeguards through you know, CRM and, and other things to, to prevent the human, human mishap. Does, does that answer your question? Uh, it does to a point, and uh, that is the step one, I would think, would be to look at yourself. I think point two that ALPA started to look at is how we look at not just ourselves, but we, as Joe, you mentioned too, that we look at each other, and each all the airlines together look at their operating systems and determine what's the best and what's what could be better. No one airline has a a perfect operating system. They all have some things they do good, some things they do bad. And I guess you've done a study of your operation individually, perhaps collectively, that would be some advantage to us to work with you. As Joe has perhaps has suggested, there might be a seminar where we might work together 
to look yeah. at how you do things, how we do things. So, so along those lines as well, you know, we haven't kept the focus internal only. Uh, we've we've brought in an outside team of uh, aerospace experts as well to, to give us an independent look at our procedures. And that includes, you know, just not, not just the flying stuff, but also the design and a lot of those decisions as well. So, um, you know, we are essentially doing what you're talking about. Cool. Thanks. Thank you. We do have a text message question. Hi, good afternoon, Larry. Uh, the question that came in on the text message was, how does the FAA determine which space operations can utilize licensed spaceports? And uh, we'll probably need to make this our last question. Kelman. Well, uh, an applicant would, would come in and uh, through their application, they would indicate uh, the particular site or location uh, where they intend to conduct their launch. And we would evaluate uh, against our licensing criteria, uh, the public safety as it relates to uh, that particular area. So it's really a choice that the license uh, of the vehicle operator makes um, in terms of what spaceport they want to use. And we do environmental reviews, we do a public safety review to assess the risk. We look at the population areas in and around that spaceport uh, to assess how we need to protect the public there. Uh, and again, if everything checks out against our regulations, we go ahead and we, we issue a license. Uh, but that's, a, that's very much a determination or a choice that's made by uh, the vehicle operators. All right, well, in conclusion, I'll say that that last question was something that, uh, as Joe raised, did alert us initially to getting more involved uh, when the spaceport application came through for Denver. And I called the folks that I've worked with over, the, over my career and were assured that there are no operators planning to fly out of Denver and so forth. But it was hard for us to imagine then how they just, you know, can get a license and so forth. So uh, we will be working on all these things together. Obviously we do uh, appreciate you being willing to come here and talk to us. We, uh, I do think, have a lot in common and we also have a lot of differences. So uh, thank you for joining us on this afternoon and help me give the panel a hand. <laughs>